I think you know why you're here, and I think I can guarantee you, having spent uh, several enjoyable and not altogether silent hours with the gentleman on my left and my right, that you're going to have a good time this evening. An introduction probably is not necessary, but uh, I, I cannot refrain from passing along to you some of the information that's available to me in the biographical sketches that are uh, given out by and for these two gentlemen. On my left and your right, where perhaps he belongs, <laughs> is Jack Kilpatrick, James Jackson Kilpatrick whose biography starts out with what I think is a very nice touch. Under his name is the simple and I think very proud legend, one word, newspaper man. Jack Kilpatrick, it says here, dates his career from the intoxication moment, the intoxicating moment at the age of five, <laughs> when his first published work appeared. At first published work was a four-line epic poem in praise of the victor in the first grade marble tournament. <laughs> the verse itself was something less than immortal, but the byline was beautiful. The budding journalist was born in Oklahoma City in 1920, became a copyboy at age 12 for the Oklahoma City Times. At 16, he entered the University of Missouri. At the age of 20, he was graduated from the School of Journalism there. He went directly to the Richmond, Virginia News Leader in 1941 as a general reporter, specializing in politics and court coverage. In 1949, he succeeded Douglas Southall Freeman, a proud name, in the editor's chair. And Jack Kilpatrick soon established a national reputation as a fighting editor with a gift for a well-turned phrase. And he won many honors and awards, which I won't even bother to try to enumerate now. But in 1964, while he was still the editor of the Richmond News Leader, he began writing his nationally syndicated column with the name A Conservative View. And the column caught on, it now appears, in more than 280 American newspapers. Early in 1967, he left Richmond and established a new base in Washington. And there began a fresh career as journalist, critic, and television commentator. He spends three to four months a year on the road, both in the US and abroad, writing, lecturing, debating, and covering news. He's a frequent panelist on Meet the Press, a regular commentator for the Columbia Broadcasting System and its Washington affiliate. And as I'm sure most of you are aware, he and Nick Von Hoffman appear on Sunday evenings on the 60 Minutes television report on the CBS television network in a miniature debate of the kind that we're to hear tonight. At the end of the road for Jack Kilpatrick, in one sense, is his home in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, 80 miles west of Washington. He writes a column there very frequently under the dateline of Scrabble, Virginia. His wife is a noted Virginia sculptor. They have three sons, one granddaughter, four cubbies of quail, and a ham actor collie named Lorenzo. Then, in this corner, Jack Kilpatrick. <laughs> and on my right and your left, we have Nicholas von Hoffman. I have seen a good many biographical news releases of one kind or another in my uh, career as an introducer. And this one starts in uh, a most unusual way. I want to quote it to you word for word. In a career that started low and is still sinking, <laughs> Nicholas von Hoffman first achieved a second-rate sort of notoriety as Saul Alinsky's top outside agitator. It was easy to achieve a reputation as a rabble rouser. This is rebel rouser, not rabble rouser. It was easy to achieve a reputation as a rebel rouser in the 1950s, but in the next decade, the occupation began to crowd up and the competition stiffened. So von Hoffman switched to journalism. In 1963, he was hired by the Chicago Daily News to cover race, cities, and stuff like that there. He did this so well, the paper suffered a nearly fatal drop in circulation. <laughs> A switch to a healthy organization was in order. And thus, in 1966, he came to the Washington Post. The fact that the Post enjoys a morning monopoly explains why it continues to grow and prosper despite years of having printed NVH's Balshi drivel concerning blacks, hippies, dope fiends, and peaceniks. Because of his congenital inability to write a straight news story, and in the face of rising cancellations, in January 1969, the paper decided to isolate him by having him write a column three times a week. 
Thus quarantined with a disclamatory slug under the byline, he has preached child molestation and socialism happily ever since. <laughs> the column has been so successful that recently Ron Ziegler was quoted as saying he never reads it. <laughs> Moving rapidly on now to the latter part of Mr. Von Hoffman's official biographical release, we quote, Lately, Von Hoffman's been making a reputation on TV as Mr. Left. It's a cheap but effective way of countering criticism that only right-wingers are given airspace or airtime. At 42, Von Hoffman is enjoying his new life as an electronic ham, but he's still addicted to ink and intends to keep his lineal demagoguery, too. A more re sober recital of this unfortunate man's curriculum vita is available on page 2,354 of the current Who's Who. Pay no attention to it. <laughs> End of the official biographical release from Nick Von Hoffman. So in this corner, Nick Von Hoffman. <laughs> now to the format. We're going to have five topics selected. And we're going to have each of these men give his particular point of view on each of these topics for five minutes. It is my unhappy job to look at my watch, to see to it they use no more than five minutes, and somehow to pull them away from the microphone if they exceed those five minutes. So the first thing we're going to do, and I wish that the first person right here on the aisle would come forward, I'm going to give you a spread of cards here on which there is a number of uh, cards to be pulled. I will ask you to select five of these cards, and they will be the five formal topics. Pick any five. All right, thank you. Absolutely unrehearsed. <laughs> these have been kept hermetically sealed in that well-known mayonnaise jar. And I hasten to tell you that you will, of course, have an opportunity to ask questions of the debaters after the formal part of their encounter is over. So if you've got things you want to ask, uh, don't hesitate to bring them up then. All right, these are the five topics that were chosen. Equal rights for women, capital punishment, <laughs> capital punishment, amnesty, amnesty, the future of the Republican Party, <laughs> and an action on which there was some uh, voting in Congress today, public financing of elections. Now, there were several other interesting topics there that I'm sure you'll want to get them to, so don't forget that you've got a chance to ask questions. I think I'll take those in just the order I read them, and uh, I'll get my wristwatch in hand here and clear the underbrush away, and we'll get started on equal rights for women. I believe we'll move from a left to right uh, situation in terms of my position rather than yours. And so I'll ask Jack Kilpatrick, what do you got to say about equal rights for women? All right, I'll take a position on point. I oppose the pending constitutional amendment purporting to grant equal rights for women. Oppose it on a number of grounds. The first of them is largely philosophical, a reflection, I suppose, of a general, generally conservative outlook on the Constitution and on government. I think we ought not to fiddle around with our supreme law if there is any reasonable way of obtaining a desired social or political objective in any other way. Uh, this Constitution of the United States is fundamental. It sets up a structure of government. It purports to do certain things. It is deliberately ambivalent in certain areas. Uh, I rather like the Constitution the way it is. My own feeling is that this can be accomplished, this very useful, desirable goal, that it can be accomplished in two ways, three ways actually, without the drastic remedy of a constitutional amendment. One of these ways is through judicial decisions. A second is by congressional enactment. A third is by statutory remedy within the individual states. And the interesting thing is that it is now being accomplished along all three of those avenues. 
Case after case, the United States Supreme Court, in effect, is itself ratifying this amendment. If you cover the court or watch it carefully, you will have seen this trend developing over the past five years especially. Whenever there has been an opportunity to broaden the interpretation of the 14th Amendment so as to make it act against discrimination against women, the Supreme Court has seized upon that opportunity. Uh, there has not been a case won by any state or by any person resting his case upon discriminatory law. The leading case is perhaps one out of Idaho where the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional a certain law having to do with the administration of estates that said uh, all other things being equal, the uh, surviving male was to be preferred to a female in terms of administration of an estate. Threw that out, that this sort of discrimination would not be tolerated. The states themselves, one by one, are repealing those laws that unfairly discriminated, discriminated against women you know, in certain areas of employment, for example. Said that they couldn't lift weights of more than 50 pounds, one thing after another. These things are being eliminated very steadily. At the congressional level, we already have on the books the Equal Employment Opportunities Act, which specifically prevents discrimination in employment by reason of sex. That's the law now. It remains only to be enforced. Now, in a second broad area of objections, I have a notion that while this Equal Rights Amendment may be desired by a great many professional women, it's by no means so enthusiastically desired by women who work in factories, in laundries, in certain retail establishments. One of the most poignant and effective arguments against this amendment while it was pending in the Congress, was made by the Lady Garment Workers Union, whose spokesman said they had spent 50 years in one state after another trying to get these protective acts on the books that gave women certain opportunities or certain privileges uh, that they would not have otherwise, and they did not want to see them wiped out. And the political realities are that some of these privileges now written into law for women are not going to be extended to men in the name of, of equality what will happen is that they will simply be denied to women. I'm not sure women want that to be done. So that's my argument against the Equal Rights Amendment. The good purposes can be accomplished by court decision, by congressional act, by state legislative action. This is a drastic piece of legislation of unknown effect, unknown effect in terms of um, military service, unknown in its effect upon a great body of law built up over centuries, common law, dealing with wills, administration, estates, custody of children, divorce, all of these things are now would become uncertain if this is written into our supreme law. It would become operative two years later and we don't know what it would mean. Uh, I would prefer to cure these ills slowly, gradually, one by one, but effectively, rather than go to a drastic remedy that may, and I think would, accomplish more ill than good. Don't clap. He's wrong. <laughs> I'll tell you why he's wrong. First of all, Jack views the, uh, the Constitution as a kind of Stradivarius violin. It is to be visited every so often and admired, but not used, <laughs> and certainly not changed. Uh, I, uh, uh, while I probably don't have Jack's reverence for the document, I do have a good deal, but I still believe that it can from time to time be changed. And I think this is one of the times when it should be changed. Uh, Jack says that um, um, it is not necessary because we have judicial remedies and uh, uh, or that the courts are deciding slowly or rapidly in favor of of equal rights in the sexes, uh, that the states, the state legislatures, that the Congress are, are, are redressing and repealing these old laws, as he put it, one by one. Now, there are a lot of old laws to be repealed one by one. Uh, countless, no, nobody knows how many. Uh, there would be a lot of lawsuits. 
Now, I think if you get to a point in time where there is an overwhelming agreement that all the people in the country should enjoy the same rights, that it is absurd to say to slightly more than half of those people, look, we think you should have the same rights, but we don't want to include that statement in the fundamental charter law of the land, but you go into court and sue time after time after time. And the way things are going, you're going to win. Of course, it'll cost you a lot of money. It'll take a lot of time. And we'll fight you all the way up to the Supreme Court on each occasion. But you're going to win. Uh, so you don't need a constitutional amendment. Now, I, I say to Jack that that is, is um, self-evidently uh, uh, unsupportable. Uh, in fact, I think his argument demonstrates exactly why we do need it, to save expense, to save time, to, ex to save this, this, this endless uh, finding every time you turn around that it turns out there's some new set of regulations uh, um, uh, 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 holding women down or keeping them out of someplace else, the rest of it. Now, Jack says that the, um, the spokeswoman, I believe it was, for the International Ladies Garment Workers Union in the hearings before the Congress made a point about how that union and certain other unions had fought very, very hard for protective legislation for women, uh, particularly 40, 50, and 60 years ago. Now, that's true, but I, what Jack failed to tell you is that, that ILGU and organized labor, since giving that testimony, has changed its mind that they now do support the ERA, that there has been a great deal of rethinking about the question of, um, the, uh, of that kind of specialized uh, uh, legislation, protective legislation. And now, I think you will find that the, 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 the prevailing opinion in organized labor is somewhat the same as the prevailing opinion among conservatives as far as the universal minimum wage and uh, younger workers is concerned. That where you have special protective legislation for women, what you are doing is de facto legislating them out of a job. And uh, uh, so that the, the, the the prevailing opinion now, I think, is uh, we would rather not have that kind of protection that puts us uh, on the lines, of, uh, the unemployment lines. Horse feathers, horse feathers. The f listen, her <laughs> But, but um, now, Jack skipped over this very nimbly, but I would say this, that if we are dealing with um, uh, conditions of labor that are so harsh that they require this protective legislation, then I think they require it for everybody. Uh, it seems to me that there is this great masculine payoff or payoff for the men in the whole equal rights movement, which is that it does not have to mean that equal rights does not have to mean that women come down to the level of the men in work or in other matters. This can be an opportunity for the men to come up to the level of the women. And I see that uh, uh, the man is getting after me here. So I just want to say one other thing. As far as this drastic legislation having an unknown effect on the common law and the military, etc., that's very much like getting up here and saying, after the billions we have spent in double washrooms, do you mean you are going to render all that capital investment useless? <laughs> To be just as even-handed as I guess is possible for me to be, I think we probably ought to make this badminton game go both ways across the net. And so, Nick, I'm going to ask you to be the initial speaker on the next subject, and Jack Kilpatrick to reply to, to that. Uh, this won't give us quite an even spread, but I think if we go back and forth this way, we'll come as close to an equivalent opportunity of listening to what the other guys got to say. Hmm? Do I have to sit in his chair? <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> not unless you guys want to. All right, capital punishment. 
Capital punishment. <coughs> Take it away, Nick Van Hoffman. Capital punishment. Well, all right. Well, look. Um, there are a few among us who wish to go back to capital punishment. Uh, we have not. We've not had capital punishment in this country now, well, formally, I guess, what has it been, a couple of years, informally, longer than that, it's been dying out. Uh, oh, you caught that, did you? <laughs> uh, if, if there is any connection between capital punishment and the, the commission of capital crimes of whatever category, uh, we, nobody's really been able to demonstrate it. Now, I say whatever category because the capital punishment addicts no longer uh, are saying, you know, let's do it uh, if you, um, 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 you know, steal from the five and ten or kill somebody. Now they're saying it's only for certain things we want to use it for, like, uh, well, some of them say heroin pushers. Um, Others say, no, not heroin pushers, but uh, guards in penal institutions. Um, if uh, they are killed by people who are already serving lifetime offenses, certain other very specialized categories of murders that don't happen very often. But, the, but I think the important thing is that, uh, with the exception of the heroin pushers, uh, oh, assassinations of presidents and things like that, uh, people who who do that kind of thing, I think you would, are not going to be deterred by the thought that if they get caught, which the chances are overwhelmingly that they will, that the, that they're going to be executed, um, because whether you are um, a murdering a guard in a penitentiary or you're um, you're trying to assassinate a president, the chances not only are that you're going to get caught, but that you're going to get killed while you're trying to commit your crime. So you don't even have to worry about what the punishment will be if you live. I would say that the only time that capital punishment would be an effective deterrent to, to the crime of taking a life is when the life taker is a calculated professional killer. That is one who actually before the act says, well, I am going to do this because I figure the odds of getting away are very good and the money or the whatever, the payoff is very good, so I will go ahead and do it. Now, if you can cut those odds down, um, then I think you can deter that kind of killer from committing a capital crime. However, the best way to cut the odds down, even with him, is not to tell him, if we catch you, uh, we're, uh, we, you're certain to get your head chopped off. The best way to do it is to make catching him a certainty. And what I, th I think you will see is that, that, that murders committed by professional killers are almost never caught. So it doesn't matter what kind of, um, uh, of crime you, uh, or punishment you attach to conviction for the crime because a professional murderer is never caught. Uh, but I would... <sighs> I, I would say this, that if, if we do want to, um, uh, to indulge in this, uh, you know, go back to this uh, killing of, 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 of people, um, then I think it should be public. I don't see how uh, it can serve as any sort of deterrent if um, uh, it's done in private. I mean, if you do it in a basement or away from everybody, you know, the, the, in the last years, uh, the authorities have made it a fetish about you cannot take pictures of the moment, uh, you know, w when they, they hit the thing and the juice goes through the, the person strapped down on the chair. Uh, you're not allowed to tape record the choking of the, the, the uh, person when they, the, they first, the lungs first get hit with the gas, you know. None of that is, um, uh, that's all private for some reason. Now, that should all be on television. NBC, coast to coast, you know, we interrupt this program to bring you a special on the live news report from San Quentin, the hanging of Sammy Smith. Uh, that way, all of you potential murderers out there 
will see how Sammy Smith dies, and you will be so frightened that you will be deterred from committing the crime which you otherwise will commit. So if Jack will agree to that, and he will because he's a bloodthirsty Tory, <laughs> I will go along with his capital punishment, although I will not agree with it. Jack? Certainly I'll agree to that aspect of it, Nick. I, I, I um, I proposed this a long, long time ago before I even knew you were in favor of it. I've, uh, <laughs> I've thought about it since, and I still think I'm right. Uh, I wanted to, to do it as I used to do it in Baltimore, um, around the turn of the century. They had the hangings there near the docks in Baltimore. My thought was to get the heroin wholesaler, give him a fair trial, hang him down by the docks. Let him twist slowly, slowly in the wind and let the <laughs> drug peddlers see what uh, is likely to happen. <laughs> now, I uh, actually, I suppose Nick and I are in agreement on a number of points on this issue of capital punishment. There is no proof, I think we agree on this, that capital punishment is a deterrent or that uh, abolishing capital punishment uh, is any sort of deterrent. The figures on it are absolutely inconclusive. Any number of social psychologists have worked them over. Uh, I've analyzed a good many of them myself from time to time. They don't prove anything. So, but I think there may be reasons other than um, deterrent. Don't say Jack. <laughs> uh, uh, retribution is, um, is such a uh, good reason, I think. Let me take the legal end of it for just a moment. Capital punishment surely was contemplated in writing of the Constitution. It's mentioned there in two points. The Supreme Court, in its famous decision a few years ago, did not hold, did not hold, that capital punishment as such was cruel and unusual. There would have been no way that the Supreme Court could consistently with the Constitution have held that. And what the court did say was that in the past, the death sentence had been applied so capriciously, so arbitrarily, so unsystematically, as to make its use, in effect, a denial of equal protection of the laws. Uh, I don't think it was the finest opinion the court ever turned out, but there's a certain rationale on which that line of reasoning can be defended. I think the main reason the court acted as it did is that by that time, more than 600 human beings were in death row around and about the country, and had the court simply upheld the death sentence and no more, uh, the slaughter would have been grisly and the court had no stomach for that particular thing. But the new laws that are coming along, and these laws are demanded really by the people. Every public opinion poll has shown it. More than half the states now have undertaken to restore the death penalty, and most crimes uh, in any event are state crimes, not federal crimes. The Senate the other day passed a bill that would restore the death sentence in a very narrow classification of federal offenses. Now then, there would be, because of the nature of the fences, relatively few of these. There are not that many kidnappings in which a victim is slain. There are not that many skyjackings in which someone is killed. Uh, there are not, hard as it may be to believe this, there are not that many assassinations of presidents or candidates for president. These are still very rare offenses. Not that many cases of treason. So that the federal law, I think, would be very narrowly applied and very infrequently used. But there is a possibility that in a federal prison, uh, some life termer uh, about to kill a prison guard might be deterred. We couldn't be able to prove it, but he might be deterred by the existence of a death sentence, that possibility. That really is about the only example that occurs to me in which it would positively act as a deterrent. Nick has said there hasn't been any wave of prison guards being killed. Uh, since the death sentence, in effect, was abolished, and he's right. But, um, these things have happened in the past. They, we would certainly like them not to happen in the future. I think it ought to be understood that the federal bill does not apply to most crimes of murder, most crimes of murder being acts of passion. Two-thirds of all the murders that are committed in this country are family affairs. Ordinarily, wife shoots husband, husband shoots wife, or a wife shoots mistress or a husband shoots lover, that is two-thirds of the murders in the country. No one is proposing that the death sentence be extended 
to crimes of passion of that sort. What is proposed, seriously proposed, and I defend it, is the idea of making this extreme but ancient punishment available in a narrow class of especially vicious, heinous crimes. Now, I see nothing wrong with making this an optional punishment available for our courts to use under those circumstances. Our next subject is amnesty, presumably referring to persons who have chosen to go to another country to avoid the draft or who have uh, left while actually under uh, a term of military service. Amnesty and Jack Kilpatrick, uh, following this pattern that I hope we've established now, we'll ask you to speak to that first. You all pull some tough ones out of that hat. Um, let me sort out a few ideas as rapidly as I can on this question of amnesty. I oppose any general grant of blanket amnesty as has been proposed in some quarters and by a good many groups. I oppose it for a number of reasons. First of them, and perhaps the last of them also, I think it would be gravely unjust unjust to all kinds of people and interests. All cases of amnesty are not alike. I have asked from time to time when the subject has come up, who are we talking about in this business of, quote, amnesty, unquote? Uh, there's several thousand young men, but what young men are these? And there seem to be several classes who come under this. There is the young man who never registered for the draft at all. There is a young man who registered for the draft, showed up for induction, and refused to be inducted, and fled before our... Could hear their stories, find out if this was a, a boy of 17 with limited education who got some exceedingly bad advice and panicked. For such a young man, you could have a good deal of compassion. For a well-educated young man who uh, entered service and deserted in some sort of critical moment, uh, I think you would have perhaps less compassion. In the back of my head is the truth that for every young man who did not go, who fled, and I think some other young man had to go in his place. Uh, this is elementary. It is undeniable. Those ranks had to be filled up under the system as it existed at that time. And a great many of those men who filled up the ranks went to Vietnam and never came back, 45,000 of them. This matter is viewed passionately by veterans of Vietnam, most of them at least, who feel that they went and did a dirty job that most of them despised, were afraid of, didn't like. They did it out of a sense of obedience to law, sense of duty, and they went. As I say, many of them did not come back. For those who felt this deeply about the war, there was always available to them as a matter of law from the very beginning, the conscientious objector status. They could have gone and served their country for two years in a non-combatant status, as medics, looking after the wounded, doing other non-combatant service. Uh, they refused to accept that option. They simply fled. Now, I, I don't want to um, represent to you a vindictive or an unforgiving point of view. I think a great many of these young men who acted in real error or out of ignorance can be forgiven. But there's some that I do not believe in justice should be forgiven. In any event, not yet. Um, well, let me attack this on three levels. Um, first would be, I have to say, since Jack is saying that, that for those who did not go, others went, and some of those others did not return. Well, that is true. I think you can also say those who refused to go, those who fled, those who deserted, and those who resisted may also have played a very important part in bringing this insane war finally to an end. I think that many of them displayed a very special kind of heroism and made a great sacrifice. Now, um, on the next level, let me talk about the law that sent uh, these, um, all of these men into the army. I think that law 
was unconstitutional. I think it was a wrong law. I do not think, and I, of course maybe this is our capital punishment argument again, uh, if, I, if I do not think that state should take lives of criminals, I do not think the state has a right to take the lives of non-criminals. And the draft law is the taking of the life and liberty of people who have committed no crime, who have been sentenced by no court, who have been tried by no jury. The draft is simply scooping people by lottery, by this, by that, off the street, imprisoning them, and very often sending them off to die. I think the only circumstance that a draft in a democratic, free country like this one can be countenanced is when the very life of the nation is at stake, when there is an immediate need, a palpable need, for soldiers because 10 million North Vietnamese are poised in San Francisco Bay about to overrun California. I think that is the only justification for suspending the Constitution in this drastic fashion. And I think ultimately we are going to get a Supreme Court that is going to say that the conscription is simply an elaborate uh, uh, form of slavery, and that's all it is. And that these people who defied it broke no law. All right, but that's going to be a long time before I win that one. Now, I think on, the, on, on yet another level, Jack is offering a compromise. He's saying, listen, the big shots in Washington, the veterans, politicians, the legion commanders, the, the puffed up characters, you know, that, that make the speeches on the patriotic occasions, we have to save their faces. So we'll do that by, by saying we're not going to give an inch. This is an important principle. But of course, if there are certain, you know, exceptions due to hardship, ignorance, stupidity, etc., we'll We'll let, you know, we'll wink at that and we'll have these commissions go out. Well, I'll buy that. I mean, the, the, the over, the long run principle that I've enunciated earlier, that's going to take a long time winning. In the meantime, the whole point of this is, is to, uh, you know, to wave some kind of wand of forgiveness over these people so they can come home again. And if Jack, Jack sounds, it sounds to me as though Jack has a formula. Uh, we also have a precedent in that um, uh, I say to this, if, uh, if, if our people can give Agnew amnesty, Jack and his people can give our people amnesty. Next, the future of the Republican Party. Have you had time to think about that one? Yeah. All right, Jack, do you want to rebut? <laughs> Dizzy constitutional law on this, or are you just going to talk politics? <laughs> oh, you want to go back to the last one, then, Ann? <laughs> Listen, you really ought to read the Constitution. I, I am, I, I'm as, as, at least as screwy a constitutional lawyer as you are. <laughs> Uh, the future of the Republican Party <laughs> is slightly worse than the future of the Democratic Party. <laughs> the, the major reason for political parties today is that it is very hard to get on the ballot and get elected if you are not a member of a party. Uh, I mean, all the laws in all the states are rigged in such a way that if, if you do not label yourself Democratic or Republican, it is very tough, you know, to, to get on a ballot. Uh, other than that, I don't really think the two political parties exist, or not very much. And for that reason, I am not going to say, ah, Richard Nixon has killed the Republican Party. Now, if the Republican Party had been some cohesive group of people 
with some stated set of principles uh, uh, that you could say Nixon stood for and have been shot down and disgraced, I'd say, well, they're, they're in very serious trouble. But the Republican Party is only slightly more cohesive than the Democratic Party. Uh, and um, Democratic Party politicians disgrace it every day and it doesn't seem to affect uh, the party. It's still here bothering us. So the Republican Party will do the same. Um, I think we are in an era where there really is no party system. What we have increasingly are what I would call bands of marauding politicians. <laughs> Every couple of years or so they get their, you know, their, their henchmen and their underlings and they form an ad hoc political organization and they fly some kind of a flag, um, which they do very vaguely under some sort of party designation. Uh, and uh, they try it and they make it or they don't make it and uh, uh, they go on from there. So, um, uh, and I think you can also see, if you look back um, over the last five or 10 years, you'll notice um, in, uh, in November 1972, you could read all this stuff by all the political people who know about this. They said, well, that's the end of the Democratic Party for 25 years. Nixon has formed the new, what was that, the Sunshine Coalition, the new majority. What was that thing? What were they calling that, Jack? I'll think about it. Uh, I don't know. It had something about it. There was this marvelous linkage of states from coast to coast that would be electing Republican presidents from now to the end of the century. Um, in just, uh, you know, six years before that, or eight years before that, I can't count, in, in 1964, they were doing the same thing with the Democrats when Goldwater got buried. That was the end of the Republican Party. Um, again, we are in an era where these parties take a tremendous shellacking, and because they are so amorphous, so unformed, so, um, so not parties, they bounce back again because you, get it, you need it for legal purposes. I mean, it's the shell corporation. And, you know, and, and every so often a group of these marauders get together and they seize it for a while. And they use it and then they're killed off by other marauders who grab it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a seashell. It's constantly being inhabited by new groups of parasites. <laughs> and that's what a party is. And I, I have no reason to believe that um, some new group of banditti won't get a hold of the Republican Party and con us into voting for them again in the near future? <laughs> I don't think they're going to con you into voting it for the Republican Party in the near future, Nick. Uh, I think you'll just continue to vote your old anarchistic way. And <laughs> Republicans wander on. <laughs> my, my distinguished and able adversary took um, a rather different tack from the one I had expected him to take, but I'm willing to follow along behind him in a discussion of political parties generally, rather than as to the Republican Party especially. That's what we were asked to discuss. I told you he was going to discuss whatever he wanted to. The prediction has been made by a good many pundits that the Republicans will lose probably 40 to 45 seats in the House in November, maybe 9, 10 seats in the Senate. If those predictions are fulfilled, we would have on paper what the AFL-CIO especially has referred to as the veto-proof Congress. Uh, this is something of a fiction, not a reality. Dollar. Yeah, a lot of fictions floating around Washington. But the idea would be that there would now be on paper at least enough Democrats that if they all stood together, they could override a veto by Mr. Nixon or by Mr. Ford or whoever. Uh, very unlikely, I should think, very unlikely because the Republicans and the Democrats now never stick together as party people after the opening day of a Congress in any event. So uh, my, my guess would be that the Republican Party will still be around for quite a while, even if it took such drastic losses as that in November. I don't think my, myself that the loss will be as great as 40 or 45 seats in the House, nine or 10 in the Senate. I think there might be about half that in each chamber 
because by November, I hope that a great many Republicans, conservatives, will have shaken themselves out of the doldrum and will have taken a cool, sober look at what the consequences would be to their interests of such a veto-proof Congress. They will have rallied around and undertaken to get behind some good Republican candidates and um, vote them back up. But we'll see. I, I got out of the prediction business when I swore up and down in lecture season one year that Ed Muskie was going to be the Democratic nominee. So I, I'm out of that business. I will respond to some of the points Nick made about the decline of political parties generally because I think they're true and I think they ought to concern us. Various studies have been made along the, these lines, all supporting precisely the point he made. Our parties are much less important in our political structure now than they were 7,500 years ago. A number of reasons for that. There was a time when the political party was a source of, of much that now is done in the name of welfare. If you were in Chicago or New York and you needed a scuttle of coal, why your local Democratic alderman was, uh, or your Democratic club might provide that scuttle of coal. If your cousin needed a job as a trolleyman, why the local uh, Democratic captain could go out and get him the job on the trolley car. Well, a vast deal of that's been wiped out. Welfare has taken over the Thanksgiving basket and the scuttle of coal. The Civil Service Commission now controls all of these public jobs. The political party has very few rewards that it can pass out. And because it has no rewards, it has no really effective discipline upon its own members. Without rewards, without discipline, it, uh, a party gets to be a rather amorphous institution. We've had television arising which can go over the heads of the party structure. You get an able and a personable candidate, and he doesn't need the party quite as much as he used to. We've had the growth of independent voting in this country until, so the 1972 elections found, almost half of the young people who were registering under the new arrangement, almost half of them were registering as neither Republicans or Democrats, but as independents. Republican registration formally is now down to something in the neighborhood of 23%. Democrats are somewhere in the neighborhood of 33%. And the balance, more than 40% of the entire electorate now regards itself as independent. So your party structure as such has is, is, uh, been greatly weakened. I'm sorry to see this trend develop. I think political parties, as Nick said, have a very useful function in our that. political system. Oh, permit me to agree with you once tonight, Nick. <laughs> we'll reflect on this later. Maybe we'll never debate this again. We do need parties for all kinds of reasons. Uh, they do provide an order and a system and a plan in our political operations. They do go out and raise some of the money, at least honestly. Uh, they, <laughs> they do get some candidates. They do all the gut work of seeing that the, the laws are complied with and the ballots are printed. All of these things are done by our party machinery. I think we need it. Uh, I think we need a two-party system rather than a splinter party system as they have in, say, France or in Italy. And I hope that the Republican Party has not been fatally wounded. I don't think it has. You've led us very neatly, Jack Kilpatrick, to the next and the final of our selections by draw of the topics to be discussed during the formal part of the session. And that is this matter of how one does finance elections, election campaigns, and specifically, the title was The Public Financing of Elections. Jack Kilpatrick, will you start that one out? Mr. Chairman, um, uh, Jack, listen, maybe, because uh, I could respond to what you said that leads into that, so maybe I ought to go first, and then you can right. counterpoint me, if that's Bye. all right. I'm just I'm delighted when he gives Giving you the last word, you should. Yes, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, uh, look. Don't, don't believe these sly fellows when they say all this stuff about political parties. One, the, the, uh, to go back to those, um, those Constitution writers that you like so much, Jack, they were very, very suspicious of political parties. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why they, these parties become unstuck, which is not, and I'm not disagreeing with what Jack's saying about the, the decline of patronage, but one of the reasons is because the, f the political system of this country is, in its, in its formal apparatus, so decentralized. And this was done deliberately when they cooked up the Constitution. Now, I think there is one 
there's, there's one kind of advantage um, in that, and that is that I think that if, if one is uh, afraid of centralized power, um, a strong, strong national political parties, I think, tend to be the handmaidens of centralized power. I don't say that it has to be, but I think um, it, they tend to be because in order for strong national political organizations to exist, they have to, they have to ride over the centrifugal tendencies of the political system, which is every state and region for itself. And that brings me to the question of campaign financing and things of that sort. Um, we, I think we can go down one of several roads, and one of them is to arrange our campaign reforms, should we get them, which is unlikely, in such a way that we strengthen political parties, and the other is that we do not. Um, what I mean by that, for example, let's say that, that, that one way we wanted to, um, um, uh, to squeeze some of the excess money out of presidential politics is to, 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 to put time limits on the campaigning uh, so that you can't have these long, expensive campaigns. If you've got campaigns that are, say, limited like the English, you know, to three weeks, I mean, there's just no way to spend $50 million. And, or put it another way, there's no way that you can look like you're spending $50 million when your personal secretary and friends are taking $25 million of it out the back door. Uh, so, but at the same time, when you do that, you, you, you place enormous power in your, in your party caucus because you're, you're going to say, all right, uh, if, if, you, if you cannot build candidates up from scratch over a long period of time, if they, they have to be selected by central committees and what have you, so you strengthen your, your, um, um, your party structures that way. And I think that, that um, one of the things that we have to look out for when we get into this area of, of, um, of reform is, um, is which way do we want to go? And right now, it is very fashionable to lament the decline of the political party, to blame Watergate, to blame everything on it, and to run around and say, oh, you see, this is what happens. You get these terrible advertising men from Disneyland instead of professional politicians with party allegiance, and the first thing they do is they try and overthrow the government. If we only had good old-fashioned party loyalty ward healers, this would not have happened. Um, so beware of that. And Jack, now I'll give it to you, and maybe I'll come back and nibble at you. What are you doing? Holding some time on me? Yeah, I'm holding a, a minute or two. How, many, how much time did he hold? Use three minutes. He has two? Well, I might just use two and hold three, then. I... <laughs> no way to get the last word. Sneaky. <laughs> you conservatives aren't supposed to be that way. I have to yield a few points here and there on this business over election reform. The abuses of 1972 were disgraceful, indefensible, and I don't propose to defend that system for a moment. I am convinced that we can come up with some sort of effective legislation that will prevent these, uh, or at least punish very severely, the kind of cash contributions that were floating around in the 72 campaign, uh, the sort of things that were done uh, that were punished mildly. I think a lot can be done in the way of election reform simply by tightening up on the laws that we have enforcing them somewhat better. I am opposed to the pending notion, a bill that is likely to pass the Senate, I suppose, tomorrow, providing a scheme of taxpayers' financing of political campaigns. Reject it on a number of principles. For one, this compels a taxpayer to pay his money. It takes the money from you, you, and you, and turns it over to a private political party or to a candidate in order that he may promote ideas that may be absolutely offensive or distasteful to the taxpayer. This, it seems to me, is no proper function of government. I object to it when any one of the governmental departments gets into the newsletter business and starts lobbying and propagandizing for its own points of view, but actually to take tax money to be spent to promote this guy to hold an office that now pays $42,500 a year, uh, seems to me just I, I don't like that idea to begin with. 
Secondly, there is an absence of accountability here that bothers me in terms of public monies. Ordinarily, when public money is turned over to someone who receives a grant, or a state or a locality or an individual getting a grant, there is a great deal of accountability for the spending of public money. Well, there's not very much accountability under this. The money is turned over to the candidate within certain very broad guidelines. He spends it exactly as he pleases. Third, I have First Amendment problems with this. Uh, we, I didn't really expect to talk as much about the Constitution tonight, but Nick needs it. Uh, <laughs> when, when he assumes that the Equal Rights Amendment is self-executing and when he forgets that there is a specific power vested in the Congress to raise armies and navies, but anyhow. Uh, under the First Amendment, we're supposed Ray to have... Not impress them. <laughs> we are supposed to have, under the First Amendment, rights of free speech. Uh, uh, Nick would stop interrupting. I could use mine. <laughs> I... I do not see quite how, consistent with the First Amendment, you can prevent any citizen from spending his money to support a candidate for public office, to run a paid advertisement, to uh, have a billboard painted, to put a sign in his front yard. Uh, this is a common practice all over the Midwest, the sign in the front yard, support the candidate of your choice. This is a manifestation, it seems to me, of free speech. It is also, well, if it's just nickels and dimes involved in making it, it is a contribution toward that candidate. Well, if you put a ceiling on the total amount a candidate can spend, or if you put a ceiling on the amount that a, an individual can give, at some point you are suppressing or denying free speech. I don't see how you can do it. You say that you cannot give more than $300 to a candidate of your choice, but you're going to permit someone else out here or some group or club to give $1,000 worth of free time. Uh, how, how do you work that around? I don't know. I think the bill has some absurd provisions in it, as it will pass the Senate, apparently. It still will have an amendment offered by Senator Bellman of Oklahoma that would permit a fine, if you please, of $100,000 to be imposed upon any person who discloses any election returns publicly prior to midnight on uh, a quadrennial presidential election day. So any little old precinct worker, anyone who'd been back there counting the ballots in a firehouse in the most remote corner of New England comes out and tells the people hanging around there, you know, it was 12 votes for Dewey and one vote for Truman. Such a guy, you're going to find him $100,000. Well, that's, that's baloney, and it creates one more unenforceable law. I think we have enough unenforceable laws on the books as it is. This proposed public financing bill would go in the direction of national primaries, of eliminating the states from the elective process altogether. Contrary to what Nick says, this would be one of the most centralizing things you could imagine, this whole bill, because it would create a vast new federal bureaucracy needed to preside over the elections in all of these states, administer the handing out of the money, uh, accept these reports coming back in. This takes away from the states a power that they've had from the very beginning. Uh, I think that's wrong in principle. It's a drastic remedy. I think we ought to talk about it a great deal. As I said at the outset of tonight's discussion, talking about Equal Rights for Women Amendment, when we can do these things less drastically, I think we ought to try it. Because if we find then that more drastic measures are in fact needed, we can provide them. But if we start off with the most drastic, it's pretty tough to back back from it. I yield to my distinguished brother. Well, uh, Okay, look, Jack, first of all, on the Bellman Amendment, that's got nothing to do with election reform. That's those crazy politicians uh, with this uh, eccentric obsession about uh, people on the West Coast knowing how people on the East Coast vote. I mean, uh, that's not an election reform. That's an election gimmick. Uh, on the, the central question that, that Jack raised, number one, I, yes, I'm very worried about, I'm not sure that, that things like, um, uh, federal money, uh, taxpayers' money, to use Jack's expression, for, for uh, candidates. It, may, it is certainly is centralizing. A lot of that stuff is. And I, I'm, I'm bothered by the idea of, uh, of um, letting the same people who deliver the mail count the votes. Uh, uh, it, it's not reassuring. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Jack, we have to do something. We have got to do something. I mean, you can, you can find a First Amendment question in the, the right to buy an election. I can't. 
Now, you're not going to have a democracy if you have a couple of more elections like 72. You've, got, you've had, thank you. <laughs> you. You have Phillips Petroleum, Gulf Oil, American Airlines, Braniff, God knows what, admitting the most flagrant violation of the election laws, and they get $5,000 fines if you want to talk about unenforceable laws. Something's got to be done. Now, I would say this, that uh, I would go, you know, I, I agree, I'm, 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 I'm antsy about, about um, uh, uh, government money for elections. Um, you want to try full disclosures first. You want to try limiting the lengths of campaigns, except that, of course, puts a, uh, uh, a, a, a the, the unknown new candidate and gives them a real handicap. Uh, do you want to limit expenditures? Do you want to limit expenditures in such a way that incumbents have to spend X percentage less than challengers? All right, let's try some of that. Let's not go as far as, as um, federally funding elections. But you cannot stand there or sit there and say we can have a recapitulation of the past, Jack. We've yeah, got to do there. something, or in another 10 years, you're going to have an election and nobody will come. Ah, uh, Nick. You know, Whoa. somebody was always saying, don't sit there, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. Well, that's the only thing you can say to you Tories, you know. <laughs> yeah. And you know, often the very wisest course of action that could be taken is just, you know, don't do something, just sit there. All right. Think All about right, it for Jack. a while. Think about it for a while. <laughs> Maybe it's a wise course of action now to let you get in the act. So uh, will you please uh, indicate that you want recognition for a question uh, posing it to either or both of our panelists up here? And will you please, Mr. Van Hoffman, Mr. Kilpatrick, will you please repeat the question before you answer it because this is being recorded for rebroadcast later on WOI and their microphones can't pick up the question from out of the audience, so we'll appreciate Science it. always gives you a chance to think of what you're going to say. That's right, yeah. Okay, may we have a hand. Who's got a question? Yes. We can have an exchange back and forth on the You might be interested to know that that was one of the subjects which was on the cards, just didn't have to be drawn. All right, uh, now, how do we start that one? Who wants to begin with a brief statement on impeachment? What was that? So you didn't state the question. No, I beg your pardon. I didn't know what I told them to do, did I? <laughs> All right. The, the suggestion was made that we should have a back and forth dialogue of the same kind we've already had, but on the question of the impeachment of President Nixon. I'm willing to start if you'll let me kind of narrow the, the question. Only one question here, though, Jack. The if the question is. We do it hang them by the ears or the thumbs. But, you know. <laughs> That's the old Alice in Wonderland jurisprudence of my distinguished radical friend over there. <laughs> Verdict Listen, first, the evidence second. This is not a law court, Kilpatrick. <laughs> Verdict first, evidence.